Hi, I'm Lorraine Dalmeyer, and I'm the CEO of Formula Botanica, the online award-winning cosmetic formulation school. And I'm here today to answer your top 10 questions on organic cosmetic formulation. So as you can probably imagine, we've had over 10,000 students, so we've received many thousands of questions over the years on how to formulate. And we realised there are certain questions that come back more often than others, so we've compiled our top 10 questions for you, which I'm going to answer for you today in this video. We've also got a blog post which contains far more in-depth information and sits behind this video. So once you've watched me here, go and click on the link below so you can go and read the whole blog post in depth. So with that said, let's get started with our top 10 questions. Question number one is, does my formulation need a preservative? And the answer is, it depends on how it's formulated. So if your formulation contains water, then yes, it absolutely will need a preservative, regardless of whether you're formulating for yourself or for one of your customers. You have to make sure that your preservative thereby stops microbial growth and doesn't endanger either you or your customer. However, if your formulation is anhydrous, so it doesn't contain water, like this balm made by one of our graduates in Hungary, or this oil made by one of our graduates in Denmark, then no, you won't need a preservative but it really does depend on whether your customer or you can potentially contaminate or introduce water to the formulation. So think about how your formulation is going to be used and maybe even think about the packaging. You know, is there a way of dispensing it so it doesn't come into contact with water? Generally, you need to go and figure out how your formulation is put together. The rule of thumb is you may well need a preservative, but using a preservative is far safer than not using a preservative. The second question we most frequently get asked is where can I buy good quality natural or organic ingredients? And wow, there are so many different suppliers out there. We can't possibly list all of them because we don't know all of them. But our students have worked with many hundreds of different suppliers over the years and we've compiled some of our favourite ones and we often include them in our blog posts as well. The best thing for you to do is to go and build up a relationship with a supplier and ask them for documentation about the ingredients that you're buying from them. Things like safety data sheets or a certificate of analysis. These documents will tell you all about the safe handling of the ingredient and they'll give you some background information such as its chemical name so that you know exactly what you're working with. The best thing you can do is build up a long-term relationship, as I said, with a supplier, get to know them, buy from them regularly, and try and figure out exactly who supplies the best ingredients to meet your requirements. Once you're a Formula Botanica student, you also get access to our supplier guide. So you get to see many hundreds of suppliers around the world who have been vetted by our community. But get out there, go and buy some ingredients, get to know some suppliers and see what you think. The third question is, can I swap ingredients out of my formula? And this is a bit of a tricky one to answer because it depends entirely on what you're trying to make and how you want it to function and smell and look. So some ingredients, yes, they're very easy to swap out. For instance, if they're there for aesthetic purposes, but others might be a little trickier, like this balm. If I swapped out the wax that's in it and replaced it with another wax, I might make it harder or this emulsion by one of our graduates. If I swapped out the emulsifier and just put another one in at the same ratio, it might need a different percentage in order to function properly with the oils and waters in it. Same goes with a preservative. One preservative might be really sensitive to a pH range, whereas another might not. So it really depends on the ingredient that you're using and the formulation that you're trying to create. But ultimately, this is the fun part of formulating, because this is where you get to experiment and create little study projects for your home lab. Um, so I, I encourage you to go and have fun with it, because this is the fun part of formulating. Try and figure out the optimal range of different ingredients. Have fun blending different ingredients together and see what you end up with, because you never know what you might be able to create.
The fourth question is, which emulsifier do I need for my organic formulation? And the answer is, it depends entirely on the emulsion that you're making. Wouldn't it be great if there was one emulsifier that could be used in every single emulsion? Or would it? Because then every single emulsion would end up looking and behaving the same way, which might be a bit boring, actually, because emulsions can be sprayable, liquid, thin, highly viscous, very thick. You've got oil and water emulsions, you've got water and oil emulsions, and they all come with different skin feels and spreadability and textures. So you have to go and figure out what type of formulation that you're making. And you also have to think about the other ingredients you're going to be using in that formulation because they have to be compatible with the emulsifier that you're using. Go and see what the new emulsifiers are coming out onto the market all the time because there are lots of new ingredients being released continuously and they're really exciting. So go and have a play around, get some samples and figure out which ones that you like to work with best. Question five is, what is the shelf life of this product? Which is a question we've received thousands of times over the years. And the answer is, you don't know unless you undertake stability testing. And you have to undertake stability testing for any formulation that you want to sell anywhere in the world because that way you um, accelerate the conditions of use in a lab artificially throughout the testing process and you can check that your formulation remains stable for its shelf life and maybe even slightly beyond that because you don't want your emulsion to split or the color to fade or the smell to go away or to change you want your formulation to behave and look and smell exactly as you intend it to for its entire shelf life. And that's where stability testing comes in. You can also, of course, look at the shelf life of your individual ingredients and maybe try and figure out what the shortest possible shelf life is in order to give you a, a sort of a frame for how long your product will stay good. But that is not a professional method and shouldn't be used for any product that you intend to sell. So stability testing has to sit at the core of your formulation strategy and business. Question six is, how do I add color to my lip balm or any other type of formulation that you're making? If you work in the mainstream cosmetics industry, you view colors as additives that are purely there to impart a color to your final formulation. Once you become a natural or organic formulator, however, you view your colors as a badge of honor because they showcase the raw ingredients that you've used and the potential skin or hair benefits that they contain. So, I mean, there are so many different products that our graduates have sent me over the years, which are just bursting with color. And you can experiment with lots of different oils and waxes and butters. And I mean, there's so many different ingredients out there that impart color to the actual foundation formulation that you've put together and also have functional or skin benefits. You can also play around with different glycerites. You can use different powders. There are cosmetic dyes as well. So have fun playing around with the different ingredients that are out there and wear your color as a badge of honor in your formulations too. The seventh question is, how many drops of essential oil is 2%? Now, this question doesn't make any sense, of course, because you need to know how much you're weighing in order to figure out how much essential oil is going into your formulation. This effectively muddles up two questions, which is how do I calculate a percentage and how much does this essential oil actually weigh? You can't use drops when working with essential oils. You have to work with weight. First of all, essential oils have dermal limits. So there are limits to how much of them you can use in a formulation because they are highly potent ingredients. And secondly, they contain sensitizers, which have to be calculated and declared in quite a few countries around the world. So you have to weigh your essential oils in order to be able to calculate the total weight, but also calculate uh, the sensitizers that you'll be declaring on your label. Now, nonetheless, you might still be on DIY blogs on the internet. You might be seeing people say 20 drops of essential oil equals 1%, but this is absolute nonsense. And I, I challenge you to try it for yourself because every essential oil is different, has a different viscosity. Every bottle has a different dropper spout. And you'll find once you weigh out 20 drops for all of your essential oils that they all have a different weight.
So work with weight when working with essential oils. Question eight is, my formula went wrong, can you help me? And we'd love to help you. But the thing is, there are so many different things that could go wrong with your formulation that it isn't always as easy as just saying, that was it. You have to take rigorous notes whilst you're formulating because that's how you can compare and contrast your observations and your research projects over time. So when you're formulating, make sure that you take lots of notes. Write down the date, the batch, the time, the temperature, and every single observation that you make along the way, because that's how you can then go back to experiments that you've run before, and you can compare and contrast to figure out what changed. Ultimately, a lot of this comes down to trial and error. There is no single answer to every single formulation problem, which is why you must always keep notes. You must always write down detailed observations. In fact, here at Formula Botanica, we always say one of our golden rules is if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. You also have to undertake stability testing because that's how you ensure that your formulation is actually going to be safe and stable for use during its shelf life. Question nine is, I live in a hot climate and my product melted. What should I do? Now, in this particular case, you may need to reformulate and you always have to be thinking about where your customer is going to be living and using your product some climates obviously will be a lot hotter than others they'll be more humid so you may have to think about different ingredients and use them in different percentages you also have to put usage and storage instructions on your labels so your customer knows what to do with the product but the most important thing you can do is undertake stability testing as i said in one of the previous questions and answers because that way you can determine for sure that your product is actually safe and stable for use and a, co a cosmetic that's passed stability testing should therefore also be safe and stable for use in pretty much most climates. A really easy way of testing this out is by mailing a product to a friend who maybe lives in a hot climate and seeing how your formulation does once it is received at the other end. Get your friend to test it for you and tell you exactly how it looks, how it smells, if it's melted, if it's gone grainy, etc. Uh, but make sure if you are ever selling cosmetics that they are properly stability tested too. And the final question is, is this ingredient natural? I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've been asked this question over the years, because of course there are a lot of cosmetic ingredients out there that really don't sound very natural, and yet they may well be plant derived. The thing you have to do is figure out what the INCI name of that ingredient is. Now, INCI stands for International Nomenclature of Cosmetic Ingredients. And there are big databases worldwide hosted for free on the internet that you can go and search through to find your ingredient. Once you've found that name, it will give you an idea of the plant potentially it's been derived from. But another top tip is that you can go and actually look at what the supplier says on their website, because they will generally tell you if your ingredient is plant derived or not. The next thing you need to ask yourself is what does natural mean to me? Natural means very different things to many different people. So it could be just physically processed where it's just been plucked off a plant basically and undergone some minimal processing or potentially it then undergoes some chemical processing in order to create, for instance, a functional ingredient. For some people that is natural, for others it is not. There is no set standard definition of what natural means and that's why you have to create your own definition and communicate that to your customers as well when you're formulating. Our blog post on our top 10 organic cosmetic formulation questions answered goes to a lot more information on this. So click on the link below to head over there now and you'll find lots of additional resources where you can research a lot more of these topics in terms of blogs, podcasts and lots of other free materials that will help make you a better formulator. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you learned something new or you enjoyed it, leave me a comment below. Make sure that you like it, share it, and make sure that you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future videos. Have a great day. I look forward to seeing you soon.